Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Takes from Lakes podcast. I am James, and I am not joined by Nash this time. The reason I am not joined by Nash is because uh, this is a very special episode, one not quite like the others. Um, for those who don't know, like I said, I'm James, and I've run this sports podcast for the past about year and a half um, with my buddy Nash. And um, yeah, we talk sports all the time, ranging from baseball, basketball, college, all that good stuff. But um, this is actually relating to my high school senior project. Uh, I go to the Ocean Lakes Math and Science Academy, and through the academy, we're required to complete a 140-hour um, senior project relating to a STEM topic of our choice. Uh, the 140 hours go to research, um, planning, creativity, all that sort of stuff, and can require shadowing if you would like it to. And basically, out of all topics, I decided to base mine on sports analytics, especially in the baseball world. Um, throughout my life, I've been a just huge baseball fan, been, di- been a diehard fan of the Sox since 2013. You could always find my face stuffed in a baseball stat magazine staying up past my bedtime, but I've always had a love for baseball stats and just looking at really just statistics in general and math. And so I figured this would be a perfect opportunity to sort of dive deeper into my love for these things. And um, yeah, so here I I am making this product, trying to educate people on how um, baseball analytics are so important these days. And uh, yeah. Baseball is really such a unique sport. It has changed so much since the early 1900s from the days of Babe Ruth uh, and Lou Gehrig, where strikeouts would happen maybe twice a game, and you would be lucky to see it be see a home run hit over the wall. And so with that change um, in the style of play has also allowed for a change in the off the field team building and team management. And so with this new development of sort of just looking at way that teams can be built has allowed for this new wave of sports analytics. And so it really all kind of started with Billy Bean and the Oakland A's in the early 2000s. For those who aren't quite familiar with the story of Billy Bean and the A's, to keep it short, um, Billy Bean was a former player who was drafted um, to the Mets because of his just quote unquote natural talent to hit the ball and really just his figure. And back then people relied a lot on sort of instinct and gut feeling when evaluating players when really they didn't look into anything that actually mattered in baseball, like getting on base and scoring runs. And when Billy Bean being retired as a player and eventually became a scout, he realized that that shouldn't be the way that players are evaluated anymore. And he eventually became the general manager of the A's and started team building in a whole new different way, looking at um, analytics and looking at really just statistics in a whole new light um, that really just translated to winning games. I mean, I can just give you a stat. In 2002, the Yankees had a payroll of almost $113 million and won 103 games, and the Athletics had a payroll of $33 million and also won 103 games. And so the athletics had less than a third, almost a fourth of the Yankees' entire payroll, and just both won 103 games, which is very good in terms of MLB. And the fact was, Billy Bean didn't have the money to spend um, on these players that the Yankees were spending on. He was given a tight payroll um, from ownership of the athletics. They didn't let him spend money on that many players. The A's were a small market team versus the Yankees, who were an extremely uh, large market tre- team. And yet Billy Bean found ways to, despite this extremely small payroll, to find players that were um, undervalued by other teams. But uh, in a statistical sense, they really helped teams win games. And so he found these players and eventually became one of the more successful teams in MLB. And so that sort of just wraps up the story of Billy Bean and how he used this new thinking of analytics. And it's really just started a new wave in MLB for teams to think outside the box when it came to team building and um, it hasn't looked back since and it's only gotten more advanced. And with this idea, you have to sort of, I guess, organize all the stats that are just spewed out every single play with every single pitch, every single ground ball, strike all all that stuff. And with all those stats, people have to analyze and make sense of them because they can't go to waste. And this sort of topic is what I'm fascinated by. And yeah, so as all Takes from the Lakes loyal listeners know, um, we're welcoming welcoming new ones. Um, I love anything to do with sports, but I also love handling statistics and just handling numbers in general. 
And so I find out awesome. I get to do my senior project relating to these topics. So yeah, I mentioned you could potentially do shadowing as um, a way to get hours for your senior project topic. And I decided to do shadowing. And for mine, I had the super awesome opportunity to shadow, shadow Mr. John Stanley, the director of communications at the Norfolk Tides, which is a local AAA uh, affiliate of the Baltimore Orioles. Those who don't know, AAA is the level right below MLB, which is the very top of the top um, where players are sent there to develop and eventually go to the MLB. Yeah, shadowing with the Tides allowed me to dip into the idea of getting hands-on experience with data analysis in a professional setting, which is what I've always dreamed of. I mean, ever since I was a kid, I've dreamed of working for the Red Sox, or really any um, professional sports team. Like I said, I love handling numbers, love handling math, all that sort of stuff. So uh, yeah, although the work I did with the Tides may not quite be to the level of what MLB teams do now in terms of analytics, we'll get into an interview and we'll kind of get a sneak peek into that. Um, although it might not be to that level, I still found it uh, very important to get this experience um, with handling and distributing trends found in data. What I did with the Tides, basically, we handled all, all the statistics that came in from every game, every pitch, all that sort of stuff. And that went through to the MLB database, which is only open to people who work in um, MLB. So that includes minors and majors. And basically, with that database... All these stats would be analyzed and reorganized so they could be easily presented to the public, really to like the broadcaster, coaches, fans, so they can all understand it because um, some people don't quite get baseball stats um, like me or people like Mr. Stanley uh, might. But yeah, and I'll never forget my initial phone call with Mr. Stanley. Before I even confirmed shouting with him, I was literally just asking about what his job was. He said his job was to quote unquote, translate the numbers into English so people can understand. And so that kind of stuck with me. And that phrase kind of just wraps up what my shouting with the tides was. So sort of just translating it into English so that everyone can understand it. I'm going to briefly get into it. not going to try and spend too much time in it. But yeah, my shadowing with the tides was super awesome. Consisted of many tasks that had to be concluded, but one that really stood out to me was front notes. Front notes basically consisted of highlighting statistical anomalies that were put into sentence form for coaches, um, broadcasters, and fans to understand. And it wasn't that much of a complex process. The front notes took a lot of creativity, but basically you would, in the database, you would look for or look at splits, game logs, overall season stats, basically figure out what players have been playing well in either certain scenarios um, or over a certain period of time. And you would put that into sentence form. Like, for example, if a guy over the past month had been hitting better um, significantly against lefties, you would put that in there. And then that would be sort of, you would find that trend and that would be sent out because, you know, if he's hitting a hundred points higher in terms of batting average against lefties, that's something that, you know, the broadcasters should know that he so he could put it out um, on the broadcast, for example. Yeah, and then that's so basically just taking the trends and putting it into sentence form. And then front notes was definitely what took the bulk of my time of shouting with the tides. Of course, there are many other things I did. I also got to watch the game and take post game notes, which contributed to an eventual game recap that is posted um, on the tides website after every game. And on my third and final day of shadowing, Mr. Stanley figured out enough an idea what to do. And so I got to complete my own front notes that were sent out um, along with the other things that included back notes, which is basically basically just um, a chart of all the season stats of all the players, uh, stat packs, which sort of highlights those splits um, in terms of months and lefties and righties and that sort of stuff, and pitchers pages, which, which highlighted the starting pitcher of the game. Yeah, so we figured out enough an idea what to do, so I got to complete my own front notes that were sent out and post-game notes with my name being in the byline, which was super awesome. Definitely, definitely a very unique uh, experience. And along with the stats and notes side of the game, just being in a professional baseball setting was something I'll never forget. And like I said, many tasks were had to be done throughout the day, but there were some things that weren't quite uh, a commonplace, that's for sure. But I'll never forget on my second day of shadowing, being being summoned down, called down to put the tarp on the field in the middle of the pouring rain and all the fans are under safety with no rain going on. And they're all cheering me on. I'm drenched in water. Um, and that was definitely a unique experience. And I got some pictures trying to, trying to get pictures on the field, but it's kind of hard when you do that in pouring rain, that's for sure. But um, yeah.
Yeah, so I just did my best to briefly summarize how my shouting with uh, the Tides went. I could go into depth on every single thing, but that would just make this video way too long. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys have a general idea of what exactly I did and how it connects um, to data analysis and distribution and uh, all that good stuff. With my experience completing front notes with the Tides, though, I wanted to try some of my own data or own front notes relating to MLB. So I collected game logs and spreadsheets just like the MLB database um, from each of the top three hitters uh, of the Diamondbacks and Rangers, this, this year's World Series teams, for those who don't know. And I completed some front notes of my own. And so I'm going to highlight on the screen right next to me. And yeah, so basically we have three, like I said, three for the Diamondbacks, three for the Rangers, Cato Marte, Corbin Carroll, and Gabby Moreno for the Diamondbacks. Um, so this is basically the same exact thing we did with the Tides. Obviously, they were with Tides players and Tides stats. And so it's sort of just finding the trends. Like, for example, in the first um, first front note, second baseman Cato Marte led the Diamondbacks with 24 hits in the postseason. Uh, during that span, he hit 329, 24 for 73 with seven doubles, a triple, 11 RA and two homers. Um, you can read the rest of that. But yeah, it's basically, like I said, pretty much the same exact thing. Just finding what players are playing well and then putting that into front nodes that can be sent out to the public broadcasters or coaches to make um, lineup decisions, which is uh, pretty cool. But and then, yeah, not only streaks are really included, but records as well. Yeah, Corbin Carroll, first rookie since 1961, lead his, lead his team in war and make the World Series. So that sort of thing. Um, and let's read from one for Gabby Moreno. Moreno, yeah, Gold Glove Award, first time max catcher to ever win a Gold Glove. So sort of historic things as long, along with talking about the recent stats and how they performed the recent games. And then, yeah, so those are the three for the Diamondbacks and also did three for the Rangers. Um, Corey Seager, Adolis Garcia, Evan Carter. Um, there's definitely a lot to put about Corey Seager, Adolis Garcia, Corey Seager, um, World Series MVP, Garcia, ALCS MVP, and uh, Evan Carter was a rookie. But yeah, same sort of thing on um, base percentage, OPS, walks, hits, some of the things highlighted. Seager, fourth player to win multiple uh, World Series MVPs, the other one being with the Dodgers in 2020. And um, yeah, so basically, like I said, that sort of thing was what took a lot of creativity with the tie, just finding those trends, putting it into sentence form for really anybody to see and just be like, oh, that's a cool thing. Or, oh, I'll uh, mention this in the broadcast. Uh, yeah, that sort of thing. So before we get into the next part, I guess the bulk really of um, this episode and video, which is an interview with John Edwards, we'll get into that later. But um, I want to put a quick clip of an interview, other interview that we had with Connor Jones this past summer. Um, Connor was um or is a currently a professional pitcher uh, who is a free agent. He got drafted by the Cardinals in the second round and also played for the Mariners. And he pitched in the College World Series for UVA when they won in 2015, I believe. Um, and he's from local around here. I have a personal connection, so he was able to hop on with um with me and Nash this past summer, and it was a really good interview and. We had this cool conversation about analytics and if that's affected his playing career at all. And he had a really cool point that's kind of stuck with me about how he went from the Cardinals, who didn't really use much in analytics, and went to the Mariners. And even despite he talks about his arm being hurt, um, he had Tommy John surgery. For those who don't know, basically it's a season ending um, surgery for pitchers. But despite being hurt, he went to the Mariners, who use all these analytics, were like the complete opposite of the Cardinals use all these analytics, give him all these tips and tricks, and he had the best month of his career. And so he gives this really cool um, player insight into how pitchers just love this type of stuff and they'll take what they can get. And um, yeah, I wanted you guys to, because I mentioned it in the interview with John, um, which we'll talk about in a second, a couple of times. So definitely guys pay attention to this and just notice how he just talks about analytics and how he uses them. Oh, just, you know, Obviously, being a professional baseball player, different than high school, different than even playing in college, um, even though both you're com you're committing a lot of time either way. But just part of being a professional, is there anything about, you know, analytics, uh, you know, better technology or just the, the pro process that, you know, changed your approach or changed like the way you play at all? Especially a new wave of analytics and stuff. Yeah. Um, for pros. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'll say there's a lot to that. I'll say um, 
I, I wasn't exposed to a whole lot with the Cardinals. They're pretty old school and traditional. At least they were when I was there as far as analytics. So if they had it, you had to ask for it. And then what to do with that is a whole nother question for once you got your analytics. Um, that totally changed when I got to the Mariners. So they signed me like less than 24 hours after the Cardinals released me. And um, we dove in like head first. And so that I, I took basically the way my year went last year with them was, I think it was roughly three months. The first month was me just kind of getting acclimated to being a starter again. I had been like a late inning reliever closer for like three years. So I, I tried to get my pitch count back up, getting act. And long story short, I was hurt at the time. I didn't know it. I passed my physicals with the Cardinals, didn't know it. Um, getting acclimated to being a starter, you know, what have you. The second month, I had the best month of my of my life. I threw like 27 straight scoreless, threw a no-hitter. So mm -hmm. the, this whole new wow. analytical plan that the Mariners had implemented with me, it was working. And I was hurt. And I again, I didn't know it at the time, but I was, I was the best I've ever been, dominant. And then, um, you know, whether it was me pressing because I was, I was kind of like starting to felt like I was knocking on the door a little bit and starting to really get some attention within the organization or my elbow just fell apart, which is probably what happened. Um, then I had the absolute worst month of my entire career immediately following that, which is, you know, you might have a good month and a bad month, but when do you ever go from the, you're the best you've ever been to the worst you've ever been? Um, you know, immediately yeah. following each other. It just doesn't happen. And so then, you know, I was hurt. But that was basically how my season went last year. But but what I referenced earlier about playing for the Mariners, you know, I will I I hope I get an opportunity to come back and be healthy because of what I learned with them and, and the plan mm -hmm. with me and the analytics they use. And you know, it's just it's just eye opening. Do you think that like not just for you but for pitchers in general, like analytics like if teams use them or not or the extent to which they use them um really like plays a part in free agency decisions i mean when i was a free agent for 24 hours after they released me it definitely mattered mm -hmm. like yeah. i, I and, it, and it, it would be for me moving forward like i i want that help like it's it's a plan you know just you know these other players are good they're all professional so just saying hey go out there and play you know what am I just rolling the dice with my career? Like you want a plan, you want to have an idea. So I, um, I appreciate it. Not everybody does. I think mm -hmm. having the extra information and, and having a, a better understanding of yourself. I think that that's huge. Yeah. So hopefully you guys get a general idea of what players think about um, sports analytics. And we're kind of going to take that information and, awesome information from Shouting with the Tides. And we're going to move into an interview with uh, John Edwards, who is a head quantitative analyst or um, data analyst with the Seattle Mariners. And um, I kind of have a personal connection connection with him. I hadn't previously known him, but he went to uh, Ocean Lakes. Uh, I'm not sure how long ago, maybe five, 10 years ago. Um, I think about five years ago. And he was also in the Math and Science Academy and did a senior project of his own. I believe he did it he shadowed NASA, um, but yeah, he went to Georgia Tech and eventually got a job with the Mariners uh, working as a data analyst, and we just go talk about his job, about everything that he does, and just gives a good behind-the-scenes look of what the advanced analytics are like um, in MLB, and uh, like I said, I mentioned Connor a couple of times and how Connor went to the Mariners and kind of just was shown a whole new light about how the game can be approached and so yeah just take info from that and um just enjoy the interview i won't spoil too much so let's uh, get right into it uh, how you doing john thanks for uh joining me yeah how's it going james nice to be here good pretty good uh like i said before we started recording um i got a little bit of a tight schedule so i won't try and keep it too long got a uh, basketball practice but um yeah thanks for coming on and uh we'll ask you a couple of questions about your job and sports analytics in general and we'll get you out of here Sounds great. All right. So first question, before we get into what you actually do with the Mariners, just give us a quick rundown of your story and how you um, eventually got to this point uh, to work with Seattle. Yeah. So I had kind of a weird winding path. I uh, originally went to college to do aerospace engineering. And in my spare time, I decided, you know, I, I kind of wanted something to, it's a hobby that I was interested in. So I started like writing about sports. I really liked writing. 
And I got good enough for, to the point where I got to write for some places like um, the Sporting News and The Athletic, uh, which was a really cool opportunity. A lot of stuff that I was writing about was about sports analytics. Um, I realized that I wasn't good enough at aerospace engineering to really kind of make it as a degree. And so I figured, you know, well, I might try to pivot to the journalism stuff. And I ended up changing my major to communications. Um, literature media communications was the program at Georgia mm-hmm. Tech. And um, I then also realized uh, around the time that I changed my major, a lot of the opportunities in, in sports analytics or in sports writing were not, uh, sports writing was not in a great place as like a career to break into, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So I decided to lean more on the analytics side of things and say, you know, I have this experience writing about sports analytics. Let's try putting it in play. So I went to intern with the Baltimore Orioles front office uh, back in 2019. Uh, that was uh, right before my senior semester. And then when I graduated from college, I interned with the Mariners. That later turned into a full-time position working as a quantitative analyst. Um, and most recently, I am now the uh, lead data scientist of pitching for the Mariners. So I do a lot of work with our um, pitching models, uh, translating those insights into uh, how we can apply them into player acquisition and player development fronts for the Mariners. So it's a really exciting job. I really like it. Uh, The Mariners are a great organization. I'm really happy to be here. So yeah, that's a little bit about my story. Yeah, gotcha. We actually, um, with the podcast, we had Connor Jones on. He was um, a pitcher for UVA and like went to Great Bridge Streets from around here. And he got drafted by the Cardinals and they eventually ended up like releasing him or something like that and he ended up with the Mariners and he was like basically the huge difference was with between the Mariners and the Cardinals that the Cardinals like did nothing as far as like analytics and then he went to the Mariners and they showed him all this new stuff and he had like the best year of his career and so I thought that was kind of interesting and it's kind of cool that you being with the Mariners can kind of give um us an inside look on what like you actually do to make these pitchers better and so you mentioned like pitching model models and stuff like that kind of Give us a deeper dive into, especially because obviously I know um, more than the average person, I'm sure. But for somebody, the audience who might not know as much about sports and analytics, give us kind of just a rundown of what like these pitching models and everything else that you uh, mentioned uh, consists of. Yeah. So at basically every single professional ballpark, like from uh, the minor leagues up to the major leagues, um, these uh, parks are have um, radar units installed. Uh, usually it's like different kinds. Sometimes it'll be like a track man unit as one particular vendor of these radar units. Mm-hmm. Um, another one is Hawkeye. You'll see the Hawkeye closer to Major League Baseball. Um, but these units will provide information about every single pitch that is thrown in professional baseball. So it'll tell us a lot of information about like how hard the pitch was thrown, how the pitch was spinning what the release point of the pitch was, where the pitch ended up. Um, It records a lot of other information beyond that. But for the pitching models, it's the stuff that we're generally interested in is kind of like, how do these pitches move and Mm -hmm. how do batters tend to react to those pitches? And so what we do is we take machine learning models with this data and we try to help uh, these machine learning models understand based on these inputs of the uh, radar characteristics of the pitches and how the pitches were thrown and where the pitches were ended up. um, And based on how batters reacted to those individual pitches, We try to understand what makes pitches good. Um, These models help us understand like how pitches generate swings and misses or how pitches generate um, weak contact and ground balls, uh, which are productive for for pitchers. And so we then take these insights and we try to apply them in terms of uh, helping the players who we have in our own organization understand like this is what makes your pitches good. Or if we tweak this, this could make your pitch better. Um, Or, you know, we think this pitch like already is a really good pitch and maybe we can throw it more and that'll help you be a better pitcher. And then we also take these insights and we apply them to pitchers outside of our organization who we might be interested in acquiring. So um, if we're interested in like drafting a pitcher, we might be taking our models and applying them to the data that we get from like colleges to understand like this pitcher has really interesting pitch qualities and we think that we could do something with them to turn them into a good professional pitcher or maybe somebody else in professional baseball with another team. We might say, oh, we're interested in trading for this pitcher because we think that they're pitch characteristics or something that lends themselves to being a good pitcher, or there's like a dial that we can turn here where it's like, if we got him to up the usage of this specific individual pitch, he'll be a much better pitcher moving forward. So we, we take these insights from the models and try to apply them in kinds of just how we construct our baseball team and and pitching. So. Gotcha. Yeah, that's awesome. And so you mentioned um, obviously off season, like in terms of acquiring players and the draft and all that. So how does like, your in-season day of the life vary versus the off-season? Like, what is different? What does the average day in the life look like? 
Yeah, uh, the the off season versus in season distinction is is pretty key because it does mm-hmm. look very different. Um, yeah, but like my day to day. Um, so during the season, uh, a lot of the work that I do is um, generally trying to provide insights to players and coaches about um, specific tweaks that they're making or uh, how they're like trying to approach individual hitters or pitchers, just things of that nature. Um, I'll, I'll give an example that we had kind of a um, pitcher was experimenting with a new pitch in a bullpen uh, down in Arkansas. Uh, Arkansas is where one of our minor yeah. league affiliate is. And um, the coach is kind of like, hey, like this guy threw a couple of these pitches in the game yesterday on a radar unit. And we want to try to understand, like, is this a good pitch? Is this something he should continue to use and stuff like that? Um, so we went in and we pulled the numbers on that. And um, it looked like a really, really good pitch. And mm-hmm. uh, it was it ended up being like a key part of like why that guy ended up getting called up to uh, the majors this year and being a, mm-hmm. a real key part of like our major league team. Yeah. So we, we get a lot of like questions like this of like, Hey, if we adjust this, what does this do to this pitcher's pitch quality? Um, and uh, so being able to be there and provide insights for that. There's also a lot of like in season maintenance. Sometimes stuff will break. Like we have a lot mm-hmm. of systems that are just like automated to try to deliver these insights to coaches and to players. And sometimes these things will just break. And so I, I spend some time being an auto mechanic and repairing them hmm. in season. Um, yeah. In the off season, we do a lot more work in terms of player acquisition, just because it's like, there's not games going on. There's uh, mm-hmm. trades and like um, the winter meetings, for example, yeah, when major up. league baseball teams are all going to meet with agents and with each other to try to talk about trades or the rule five draft or mm-hmm. uh, other ways of acquiring players. So a lot of the work we do is focused around player acquisition, especially this time of year. And since there's not any games going on, we can kind of go in and start to like make more radical changes to our pitching models and start to like incorporate new measures that we might have like tried to experiment with in the course of the season, stuff that we think might be more valuable because it's a little easier to go in and break something in the off season when you don't have a pitcher who's going to want, you know, insights on how their game went the next day. Yeah. There's no games mm-hmm. going on right now. So yeah. breaking stuff is easier in the off season than it is during the regular season. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Especially, I mean, you think about all the teams that have like quote unquote disgusting pitchers um, in baseball terms, you know, of course, Mariners, Matt Brash, Andres Munoz, Luis Castillo seems kind of a common trend with the guys of, with some of the most disgusting stuff tend to be on the Mariners. Um, but And then as far as like what exactly you're telling, like what exactly you're giving info to, do you give it to, let's say, Scott Service, the manager of the Mariners? And does that help with um, like putting relievers in like in a certain batter, this guy does worse or better against this type of pitch? Or is it more just directed towards the players after the game? Like, yo, this worked. This wasn't so successful. Um, That sort of thing. It's a mix of both, I'd say. Um, So we go in and uh, we have like, our own approaches to kind of predictive modeling that are going to help us understand like this pitcher is a good matchup for this specific hitter. Um, we can go in and break down and say, Hey, this guy really struggles against like um, two seam fastballs that mm-hmm. move a lot arm side. Um, so if you have a pitcher on your roster who, who has a pitch that works like that, yeah, that's a good place to deploy them because you can get kind of like a better matchup in those situations. Mm-hmm. So we, we do go in and um, try to give those insights to um, like our major league managing staff so they know how to best deploy their pitchers and there are yeah. this information to make the best decisions possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we'll also like deliver these post game reports as well, kind of telling pitchers, you know, hey, you did a good job executing on these specific pitches. Like, um, you might want to like try to work on improving on this kind of thing. Um, just like something that we like really emphasize with the Mariners is like attacking um, the heart of the plate in OO and one one counts. We call it dominating the zone because it's like mm-hmm. you're you're winning the um, as a pitcher if you get a strike in those particular counts your um, odds of like retiring the batter go up pretty substantially. So we call it dominating the zone because it's like Mm. be in zone and win those counts. Um, So like we can go and give pitchers insight into like, this is how well you did with this thing. Um, You know, this thing could potentially stand to improve. So they get a lot of insights and from uh, like the post game reports that we have. I will also say that like, um, a lot of like what I do, actually, I don't spend a lot of time interfacing with the players. I just yeah, spend I just a fair amount of time interfacing that, yeah. with, with coaches, and the coaches mm-hmm. are the ones who, you know, they're with the players on a regular basis. More they personal kind of know with them. What, 
Yeah. Yeah. They know what works and what a player wants to like, or I shouldn't say what they want to hear, but like how they want to hear information. And so um, mm-hmm. our coaches are really good at communicating analytical information to players and kind of um, helping them to really understand um, the kinds of insights that we're able to offer uh, as an analytics department. Um, and so we have like, I'm really fortunate to be working with such a great coaching staff for yeah. um, who understand and can help our players understand the insights that we have to offer. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. So like I mentioned with Connor, he was with the Cardinals and went to the Mariners and they did a lot more um, in terms of sports analytics. And like you said, all the pitching modeling and stuff like that. Would you say the Mariners in particular do more than other teams? I mean, I don't know how much you know, like around the league, would you say they do more than other teams in terms of analytics and helping their players? Or is it kind of common ground around the MLB with all teams are doing the same? Because you see teams like, especially the Rays who will take, you know, random guys from other teams, Dodgers, and just turn them into all-star uh, caliber players? Yeah, it's a good question of, like, where are we in the analytics arm yeah. race? It's, like, the the floor for most teams in terms of, like, being able to deploy analytics effectively. I, I do think that, like, a lot of teams um, have, like, very robust analytics departments and understand at least some, like, there, there are very similar techniques that are applied across the league, to understand like what makes pictures good and what makes pictures bad and how to mm-hmm. apply these insights. Um, I think that, so in that case, I actually don't think we're necessarily like the, I, I wouldn't necessarily say like, we're the smartest team. Like mm-hmm. uh, I do think that uh, it's, it's hard to say who the smartest team actually is yeah. uh, just because it's like um, the, I, we're not going in and comparing our models with other teams, but yeah. I will say that I think that what I have heard from across the league and from like the players who come in from outside of our organization and come into our organization, what their perspectives are um, relative to the teams that they were with before um, is I think that we're really good at communicating our information to players and helping them kind of understand, um, understand and buy into our information. Mm-hmm. I think that that's like the, the, the really key thing that I think that we're good at is that our coaches are really good at helping players understand like, Hey, this information is here for your benefit. We acquired you for a reason. We think you're good at this stuff. We're going to let you go and play and and do your thing and, and help you to do the thing that you're best at. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of emphasis on kind of like positive reinforcement and getting people to understand like, hey, you're a good pitcher. Um, like you can do these things really, really well and let's play off of your strengths. I think that kind of messaging really resonates with pitchers um, and players who are coming into our organization. And I think we're, we're really good at messaging that. I think that that's the thing that kind of makes us stand out from other baseball teams. Yeah. So like word gets around and that helps with, you know, like you said, free agent acquisitions and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. We had, um, we had a, 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 I'll try not to name too many names here, but uh, Paul Paul Seawald, uh, who is um, our closer for, for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um, he came in as a minor league free agent from the Mets, uh, which was where he had spent most of his time. Yeah. Um, we were able to make some tweaks with his, um, like with the way that he pitched and to mm-hmm. his credit, he bought in on these changes like tremendously and yeah. was a tremendous pitcher. Um, so we went and we um, later, uh, we went and we uh, acquired a pitcher on waivers and he like basically called up um uh, our general manager at the time and was like, Hey, can you guys Paul Seawald me? So that kind of like reputation uh, yeah. definitely helps. And uh, something that I like take a level of pride in, in terms of like trying to help pitchers be the best versions of themselves. Like yeah. if people think that we're the guys who can help pitchers do that, then I feel an extraordinary yeah. sense of pride in that. Yeah. Um, and like you mentioned, like Paul Seawald buying in, obviously <clears throat> his career was changed for the better. Are there some people because of course some people can have in their mind that oh like the old-fashioned way just not too many advanced stuff blah 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 are there some pitchers that come in and be like I know what I'm good at I don't need help with any of this or or is everyone kind of like yeah I'll take all the modeling all that kind of stuff and it'll help me are there some people are kind of just like eh about it yeah I think uh, we try to like I, I think it's hard for me to say because it's kind of like this is much more a question for the coaching staff who spent yeah, a lot of time true. specifically interfacing with players. But based on what I've heard, uh, you know, like some pitchers want as much information as humanly possible that we can mm-hmm. give them, just kind of like want to swim in the information. And other people are just kind of like, I want to show up and throw my best pitch and just yeah. like keep it nice and simple. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that 
it can vary from player to player. Uh, and, and we again, we just kind of like try to meet people where they are. We don't necessarily want to say like, oh, like you, you change have whole, to do X yeah. or Y or Z, and because uh, I can create a level of discomfort for a player. And there are times where it's kind of like the marginal gains that you might be able to achieve by saying like, we should do this with your arsenal or we should change this. And the pitcher is very resistant and it makes them uncomfortable. Uh, the discomfort can outweigh whatever gains that you might be able to get, even if you are successful with getting them to make that change. So yeah, um, yeah I think that that's really my perspective on it is just trying to um, try to meet players where they're at. I think the best way that we do is we just kind of say like, this is information this is designed to help you. And a lot of mm. times pitchers are kind of like, we'll take the help. So Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so just give me a stone cold definition of why you think sports analytics are so important and a necessity these days. Yeah, I think about it as kind of like a I, I said arms like analytics arms race earlier, mm. but I think it's part of like the general arms race in terms of getting better at like being a better sports team i think that like at back in like the early 1900s most baseball players are uh like there's very few baseball players who are actually like taking the off season to train most of them are just like going home yeah. and working on the farm or they're stocking <laughs> shells or stuff like that mm -hmm. um, the evolution of like a professional athlete has been that like now there's no off season conditioning and training um, and now we have dedicated sports nutritionists and sports scientists yeah. to help players get better um, and get into shape better. And then yeah. professional accommodations, just kind of like th the way that you get an edge in sports is by finding the thing that people aren't doing that makes you better and doing it. And if you're not doing something that everybody else is doing, mm -hmm. then you are like hamstringing yourself. Uh, yeah. So I consider like sports analytics to be this next logical like the one of the logical steps and foundations of like how do you make a good sports team and sometimes that's you know making it so that your players don't have to go home and work on the farm in the off season uh yeah. like giving them the time to actually go and train mm -hmm. um sometimes it's like making sure that your players have like aren't sleeping on a bus all day mm -hmm. uh, it's like cross-country flights for for the mariners or stuff like that like can you imagine a cross-country yeah. bus trip for the mariners oh, gosh, yeah um so like those are like just anything that is like a part of modern, like the what we consider the modern game. I think sports analytics is a part of the modern game and anybody who is not keeping up with it and trying to invest in it is letting themselves fall behind in terms of uh, like a competitive edge. You don't want to leave anything on the table if you want to be mm -hmm. a competitive sports team and sports analytics is yeah. one of those things that you can't leave behind. Yeah, yeah, if it's there, definitely take it. Um, we'll kind of wrap it up here. What would you recommend for somebody who would want to work in the field of sports analytics like myself? Yeah, I think it's uh it's a it's a question I get asked a lot. Um mm -hmm. I think that the um main thing is to have a background in programming and in, in technical skills in general. Mm -hmm. A lot of people ask like what programming language should I learn? I generally tell them like learn one of either Python or R. Um, Python is just like very general programming language. It does a lot of things very well. And R yeah. is a bit more, um, R is a bit more, uh, statistically oriented. It's something that like a lot of people will do for, uh, like, uh, statisticians. It's, it's a very statistically friendly programming language. Um, so I tell people to learn one of those and learn it really, really well. Um, and then from there, I would say work on doing your own projects and there is like the main thing about sports data is that there is so much sports data available in the world. I mean, yeah. like if you want to know how hard every single pitch in major league baseball since 2015 was thrown, mm -hmm. that information is widely available yeah. on the internet for free. Mm -hmm. And you can do a lot of really cool and interesting things with it. Um, so I think that being able to, to uh, take that, build that out and um, do cool stuff with that data using these programming languages um, is the best way to kind of like build and acquire the skill set and show that you can do things in sports analytics. And ultimately, at the end of the day, when it comes to breaking into like sports analytics, which is a really competitive field, mm -hmm. like we just had our um, we're we're like in the midst of hiring an intern for yeah. our analytics department, and we mm -hmm. had something like 500 people apply for the internship. Gosh. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's very competitive. And so you the got best it. Way to stand years ago. Out, uh yeah i I, yeah. I but i look at the people who are applying like yeah. today and i'm just kind of like how did i get this? Yeah, they're all funny. just so smart and uh -huh. so talented but the main thing that like people do well that the, the the people who ultimately like end up working for sports analytics departments um 
that makes them stand out is that they're able to do things mm -hmm. with the data. They're able to bring in new insights and build cool products and stuff like that. And that's like, I think the main thing for helping people like stand out when it comes to trying to work in sports analytics is just being able to do things like the actual act of having a finished mm -hmm. product that you put together um, and being able to walk that product to the completion is so yeah. important. So that's, that's, that's my best advice. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, well, I'm all set on questions. If you have anything else, um, you'd like to say, go ahead, but, um, yeah, by all means, the floor is yours. If you have anything to say, ah, uh, I'll say go Mariners. Go uh, Mariners. Uh, I was about to say that myself. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Mariners are my second team. I've been always been rooting for them that the postseason run two years ago, that comeback against the blue Jays. Oh my God. Un it was very exciting. That was just awesome, but uh, I can't tell you how many people I like, tackle hugged during that oh, entire sequence. <laughs> yeah, that just insane. But um, thank you again, John, for coming on, and uh, yeah, I appreciate you. Of course, uh, thank you for having me. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed that interview with John. I thought he had a lot of interesting points. Um, I was interested in like everything he was saying. My favorite part would probably be him talking about the guy coming in and being like, "Hey, can you pull a seawall with me?" Just kind of shows that the Mariners, because they use analytics so much and use them so well, that they have this reputation that they can take anybody in and make them uh, a successful player. And like that can affect, like we were talking about with Connor, free agency decisions or more people want to go to the Mariners. And I just think that's really cool and just kind of puts it in perspective um, how much analytics really mean in the players' minds. But uh, yeah. And so that pretty much wraps up this episode pod video whatever you want to call it um i got nothing else to say i hope you guys have a better idea of how sports analytics work and why they're so helpful uh, but before you close out of this tab app or however you're watching or listening please make sure that you leave a review answering the question what is one thing that you learned about sports analytics this can be a review or poll on spotify or on apple podcasts um, anything you can leave a review on Instagram, you can leave a comment. I'll put out a poll. You can put it on that at Takes from Lakes Pod is Instagram. So please just leave one form of contact to the Takes from Lakes Pod that answers the question, what is one thing you have learned about sports analytics? And yeah, but yeah, like I said, that pretty much wraps it up. I hope you guys enjoyed and I'll catch you guys next time. See ya.